All right, welcome back. Today we're gonna to be talking about Simpson's rule. And Simpson's rule is another method of how we can approximate the area under a curve or under a function. And so previously we have seen how to approximate that area using rectangles, whether that be right endpoints, left endpoints, or using midpoints. And most recently we have seen how to approximate that area using trapezoids with the trapezoidal rule. And so when we use the trapezoidal rule, we used these trapezoid shapes to try and fit the curve of the function to get an approximation of that area. And you can think of the trapezoidal rule as an approximation of the area using linear functions, right? So if we were to look at one individual trapezoid, the top of the trapezoid that we are using to try and match the shape of our function is a linear function or a first degree polynomial, right? This would be a function like 2x plus 1 or x plus 3, right? An equation where x is to the first power. However, we can get an even better approximation of the area under a curve if we were to use a second degree polynomial or a function such as x squared. And that is what Simpson's rule does. Instead of having this trapezoid shape where the top is a linear function, we have this shape where the top is a quadratic function or a second degree polynomial. And so you can see right here how much closer these curves fit the actual curve of the function as opposed to these straight lines that are used for the trapezoidal rule. And so while there is a proof or a derivation for the formula for Simpson's rule it is a bit beyond the scope of what you need to know for calculus and it's not necessary to see in order to use it. And so I'm just going to give you the formula for Simpson's rule in this case. I don't typically do that. I like to show you where the formulas come from, but in this case, it's a bit cumbersome and ultimately not necessary for us to do when you're going through Calc 1 for the first time. Typically, you will look at the proof or the derivation for Simpson's rule in a numerical analysis class, but for Calc 1 purposes, you just need to know the formula. And so let's take a look at that now. And so here we have Simpson's rule. We have that S sub N, the S stands for Simpson's rule, where N is the number of subintervals, and that's going to be equal to the integral from A to B of our function dx. And given that N is even, meaning we have an even number of subintervals, the area under this function from A to B, that's what this integral means, is approximately equal to this formula. We have B minus A divided by three times N, and note that this could also be written as delta x divided by three. That's how I will typically write it before I start working through a problem. But delta x is b minus a divided by n. And so if you multiply it by one third, you would get b minus a divided by three times n. And so if you are familiar with the other ways that we have approximated the area under a function, you should be familiar with delta x as the width of either your rectangles or your trapezoids, or in this case, just the width of each of your subintervals. All right, but then we're gonna have delta x divided by three multiplied by f of x sub zero plus four times f of x sub one plus two times f of x sub two plus four times f of x sub three. And then we will add all the way up until four times f of x sub n minus one, meaning one value before your final value of x sub n. And that is what we will add at the end. We will have plus f of x sub n. And so notice that there is a pattern here of the coefficients of each of our terms. Our first term and our last term both have a coefficient of one, right? It's just f of x sub zero and f of x sub n. But our terms in the middle have a pattern of four, two, four, and it ends with four before the last one. And so the pattern here is you multiply four, then you multiply two, then you multiply four, and you go back and forth until you get to your last term. All right, and so that's important to remember when you use this formula. All right, and so that is Simpson's rule. And so let's look at an example problem where we use this formula to approximate the area under a function. All right, so here's our example. We want to approximate the integral from zero to eight of 64 minus x squared dx using Simpson's rule for n equals four. All right, so what this is telling us is we need to approximate the area under this function, 64 minus x squared, from zero to eight using four sub intervals. And of course, we're using Simpson's rule here. And so let's write down our formula here for Simpson's rule. We'll have that the area or the approximate area under this function from zero to eight is equal to S sub four, right? We're using Simpson's rule where N is equal to four and that will be equal to delta X divided by three times F of X sub zero and then we're going to go all the way out to our function evaluated at x sub four because you go out to x sub n from our formula, right? 
our last term had f of x sub n, and in this case, n is equal to four, so we are going to go out until we get to f of x sub four, right? So our first term is multiplied by one, but then remember, we're going to alternate between multiplying by four and multiplying by two. So we'll have plus four times f of x sub one, plus two times f of x sub two, plus four times f of x sub three, and then our last term, we're not multiplying by anything, we just have a coefficient of one, and that will be f of x sub four, right? So our first term was multiplied by one, then we multiplied by four, and then we switched to two, and then we switched to four again, all right? And so really, Simpson's rule is actually fairly similar to the trapezoidal rule in terms of its calculation. It's just that we have different coefficients for our middle terms. Instead of dividing delta x by two, we're dividing by three. All right, and so then let's go through and evaluate this. Let's figure out what delta x is equal to first. And then that's also going to be able to help us figure out what our values of x are going to be. And so we know that delta x is equal to b minus a divided by n. And in this case, b and a are going to correspond to our bounds of integration, right? We have an integral from a to b. And so that means that a is equal to zero and b is equal to eight. And so we'll have that this is equal to eight minus zero divided by n, which we are told is equal to four. So we'll divide by four, and that will be equal to eight divided by four, which is equal to two. All right, so we know that delta x is equal to two. So we'll have that this is equal to two divided by three, and then it's going to be multiplied by f of x sub zero. And x sub zero is always going to be your lower bound or your value of a, which in this case is zero. And so we'll have f of zero, and then we will add this to four times f of x sub one. And in order to get x sub one, we just have to add delta x to our previous value of x. So our previous value was zero, right? That's what x sub zero was. So if we add delta x to this, which we said is equal to two, we'll have zero plus two, which means our next value will be two. And then we'll add this to two times f of x sub two. And to get x sub two, we will add another delta x to our previous value of x. So this time we have two for x sub one, which means if we add another two, we will have four for x sub two. And then we'll add this to four times f of x sub three. And so once again, we will add two to our previous value of x to get x sub three. And so two plus four would be equal to six. And then we will add this to f of x sub four, which once again, we get that by adding delta x to our previous value of x, x sub three. And so six plus two is equal to eight. All right, and so now we're ready to calculate this approximation. So this is gonna be equal to two thirds times zero plugged into our function. And in this case, 64 minus x squared is our function, right? Whatever is inside your integral, whatever is in that integrand there is going to be our function. And so I'll just label that here real quick. This is our function f of x. If we plug zero into this function, that will be our first term here. So 64 minus zero squared is 64 minus zero. So we just have 64. And then we will have plus four times two plugged into our function. And so we'll have 64 minus two squared, which is 64 minus four, which will be 60. And then we will add that to two times four plugged into our function. So I have 64 minus four squared, and that is equal to 64 minus 16. And so that will be equal to 48. And then we will add this to four times six plugged into our function. And so 64 minus six squared would be 64 minus 36, and that is equal to 28. And then we will add plugging eight into our function. And so if we plug eight for x into this function here, we'll have 64 minus eight squared and eight squared is 64. And so 64 minus 64 is zero. And so zero is our last term there. Okay, and so then this would be equal to two thirds times 64 plus four times 60, which is 240. And then we will add that to two times 48, which is 96 plus four times 28, which is 112. And then that's it because then we just have plus zero. All right, and so then if we clean up our work just a little bit here, then we can add these numbers together and we'll have that this is equal to two thirds times 512, which is going to be equal to 1024 divided by three, which is equal to 341.3 repeating in decimal form, right? So this is our approximate value of the area under this function from zero to eight using Simpson's rule with four sub intervals.
All right, and so maybe you're curious, how close is this approximation to the actual area under the function? And so let's quickly take a look at evaluating this definite integral and see what the actual area is. All right, so here's our definite integral. We have the integral from zero to eight of our function, 64 minus x squared. And then I have our approximation over here for Simpson's rule with n equal to four of 341.3 repeating. And so if we integrate each term here in our integral, this will be equal to 64x minus x cubed divided by three, and that will be evaluated from zero to eight, right? So to integrate 64, which is a constant, we just multiply it by the variable we are integrating with respect to, which dx tells us that we are integrating with respect to x. So we have 64 times x, and then for x squared, we add one to the exponent and then divide by that new exponent. So we have x cubed divided by three, that's just using the power rule for integration. And so then we can evaluate this from zero to eight. And so we'll start by plugging in eight. So I have 64 times eight minus eight cubed divided by three. And then we will subtract plugging zero into this function or this antiderivative. And we'll have 64 times zero minus zero cubed divided by three. But this whole term is just gonna be zero because 64 times zero is zero and zero cubed divided by three is also zero. And so we don't need to worry about this term, it's just equal to zero. And so we can just focus on these two terms here. And 64 times eight is equal to 512. And then we'll subtract eight cubed, which is also 512, and that will be divided by three. And this would be equal to 1,536 thirds minus 512 thirds, right? If we represent 512 as a fraction of thirds, we would just multiply 512 by three and then divide by three. That's where this comes from. And then we could subtract the numerator since they have the same denominator. And this will be equal to 1024 divided by three, which is the same thing we got from Simpson's rule. And so this is equal to 341.3 repeating, right? This is the actual value of the area underneath this function from zero to eight. And so what happened here is that Simpson's rule got us the exact value of the area under the function that we could have gotten from integrating that function from zero to eight. And so Simpson's rule is an even better approximation than a trapezoidal rule, than the midpoint rule, and then obviously left and right Riemann sums. Now it's not always going to get you the exact value of the area, but it can happen sometimes like it did right here, but don't expect that to happen every time you use Simpson's rule. What you can expect though, is that the approximation will be very close to the actual area of that region under the function. All right, and so with that, that is all I had for this lesson. If you wanna see some more examples of using Simpson's rule, feel free to check out our examples video that I'll have linked at the end of this video, as well as in the description below. If you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments. But if you don't have any questions, this is all I had for now. So I will see you next time.